In the last year, I have become aware of a large number of academic scandals. A large number. And not just minor scandals either, but major ones involving high-ranking academics. Here are a few. Harvard's Francesca Gino, an award-winning behavioral scientist, was found by the university in 2023 to have fabricated data and has had to retract four articles. Mark Tessier-Levine, a neuroscientist and president of Stanford, resigned after it was found that research data in four of his articles had been manipulated. The articles were retracted. Diederik Alexander Stoppel, a Dutch professor of social psychology, was found to have manipulated or manufactured data in over 50 articles, all of which were retracted. Eric Stewart, professor of criminology at Florida State, was fired in 2023 after it was found that he had repeatedly manufactured data over the course of his career. At least six of his articles have been retracted. Only a week ago, a story broke that four professors in Harvard's Cancer Institute had been fabricating data. They were forced to retract six articles and over 50 others are under suspicion. These cases are not old. Three of them are from 2023, and the oldest of them is only 20 years old. So there is a lot of fraud going on in academia. This fraud comes from a number of different academic disciplines, but interestingly, none of them are by historians. Why is that? Although I am an historian, I'm going to rule out the idea that historians are the most more honest than other academics, which would seem unlikely even if I felt confident that every historian I've ever known was 100% honest. What I can do is suggest a methodological reason why historians have not been caught in similar academic scandals, and also show that they are not entirely immune, although the origins of their fraud often lies elsewhere. Most of the fraud cases I cited before were by social scientists, and most of the fraud relied on faked data. Right away, we can get an idea of why historians have not been caught committing this kind of fraud, because they usually don't use data. This isn't entirely true, but more on that in a moment. <clears throat> what is true is that social scientist data often relies on one-off experiments set up to see how people respond to a particular situation. Once the experiment is over, it's done, and there's no way to know what happened other than to look at the write-up. We have not reached the point, if we ever will, where experiments are recorded on video. This leaves a lot of leeway for the experimenter to manipulate the data, and no one can ever be sure that the data isn't different than what occurred in the experiment. If it's true that there's not a way to be sure they committed fraud, you may be wondering, how did these people ever get caught? Some cases, such as Geno's, provide interesting studies of how you might find out the data has been faked. The book Freakonomics contains a fascinating case of how teachers were caught cheating to improve students' standardized test scores. In some cases, professors weren't able to provide the data when other researchers wanted to look at it. This might not seem too bad, but the excuses themselves often seem fraudulent, such as the physicist who claimed that he had erased all his data to save hard drive space, or the social scientist who claimed that a company had collected the data when that company had in fact ceased doing that line of business long before he would have asked them to set up an experiment. Historians do sometimes do research that depends on data analytics. However, the kind of data they gather always exists in the form of documents, never as one-off experiments that cannot be reproduced. And if the data is in documents, anyone can go check if you got it right. Naturally, not many people are going to go to that trouble, but you can't assume that no one will. Michael Bellil found this out to his chagrin when his book Arming America came under scrutiny, and it turned out that his figures didn't add up. The lesson is, if you're going to lie as an historian, at least make your claims plausible so maybe no one will check. Belil is a rare case of an historian getting called out for his statistics, but he was also criticized for, quote, misquotations and mischaracterizing his sources, unquote. This is by far the bigger source of fraud for historians, both because far more do non-quantitative work than quantitative, and because it is so much harder to track down specific miscitations. Harder, but not impossible. David Abraham wrote a well-received book called The Collapse of the Weimar Republic in 1981, but it turned out that he made several mistakes, including mistranslating a document badly enough to get its meaning wrong, and quoting one of his sources when it turned out that he was actually paraphrasing. And these were deemed serious enough to undermine his thesis. He actually issued a second edition five years later, but it was also found to have problems. 
I will say that misciting sources is something that I've worried about as an historian. Translations are dangerous enough, but I'm just talking about misunderstanding what someone meant in a document. I wrote citations down word for word as much as possible, but you can't do that for everything. Then you get back home and you're writing up your book and you wonder, did this person really mean what I thought he meant? This is particularly concerning for notes taken at the beginning of a research project because your knowledge as an historian becomes so much more complete as you learn more, and you may find that what you thought was the case earlier on was really quite mistaken. If you don't have the exact words, however, you're out of luck because you're now back in the United States and the archive is in Europe and there's no way to check. You either have to trust yourself or leave it out. There's one other area of academic fraud that I haven't mentioned, but it may be on your mind because of the recent resignation of Claudine Gay as president of Harvard. Plagiarism. Plagiarism is different from the kinds of fraud I have discussed so far because it doesn't present fraudulent data, but rather steals words from another person to use as one's own. As a student, the evil of plagiarism is drilled into you, but academia seems reluctant to punish actual plagiarists. One of the most successful historians of the late 20th century, Stephen Ambrose, was found to have committed dozens upon dozens of instances of plagiarism. In spite of the evidence, he had the gall to write, quote, I always thought plagiarism meant using another people's, sick, words and ideas, pretending they were your own and profiting from it. I did not do that, have never done it, and never will. I stand on the originality of my work, unquote. You can peruse some examples yourself, the link is in the notes, to see how well this claim stands up. Ambrose wrote an enormous amount late in his career, which some have used as an excuse for his failure to cite sources. On the other hand, if you're writing so much that you can't avoid plagiarizing, maybe you need to slow down and be more careful. Besides, it turns out that his problem with plagiarism went all the way back to his PhD dissertation, so the written in haste argument doesn't hold up. The fact that he was plagiarizing throughout his career, together with Gay's case, suggests that some people might be ingrained plagiarists. Amphros invented a new term, copying without adequate attribution, to explain what he did without calling it plagiarism. This calls to mind Gay's quote-unquote duplicative language, but these language games do not change the nature of the offense. Plagiarism, by any other name, smells as foul. Academia seems surprisingly ambivalent about plagiarism, as there are those who jump to the defense of plagiarists and even argue that plagiarism is not bad or is even harmless. There are serious cases of harm done by plagiarism, such as that documented in the book Words for the Taking, but even if no living author is hurt directly, there is the unacknowledged damage to scholars who play by the rules and don't take the shortcut of using other people's words as their own. Ambrose died shortly after his plagiarism was discovered, so it is hard to tell what kind of backlash he might have faced had he lived. I would be amiss if I didn't mention one additional kind of historical writing that is less often found in scientific literature. Sometimes historical writing, the kind practiced by Belial and Abraham, is tied closely to sources and is difficult to fake. As you rise to higher levels of abstractions, however, it is easier for historians to draw conclusions and make inferences that are increasingly detached from reality. Some historians write the most errant nonsense without any fraud in the narrow sense, as they don't fake any data or lie about their sources, they just draw the most ridiculous conclusions. Even good historians are subject to this because it is so hard to analyze human societies at a high level, but the difficulty opens the door for bad historians and outright charlatans to say things that are wrong and absurd while still managing to convince people.